Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our ponder. Uh, we are uh, look at the readings for the ascension of the Lord in your ponder book on page 135. And let us begin by taking a few moments of silence, letting the world go away and letting the Holy Spirit come in. Um, in this reading we have, in the readings today, we have Christ suffused with life. So let's ask for the Holy Spirit to suffuse us. Okay. And now the um, <clears throat> prayer at the uh, beginning of the book, the opening prayer. Let the words of our mouth, mouth and the and meditation, meditation of our hearts be acceptable before you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay. May we have the first reading. Okay, the first reading is from Acts 1, 1 through 11. In the first book, Theophilus, I dealt with all that Jesus did and taught until the day he was taken up. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them by many proofs after he had suffered, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While meeting with them, he enjoined them not to depart from Ju Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, about which you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. When they had gathered together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He answered them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has established by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him from their sight. While they were looking intently at the sky as he was going, suddenly two men dressed in white garments stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing there looking at the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will return in the same way as you have seen him going into heaven. Let's start with a word or phrase that may have stuck out to you. Baptized with the Holy Spirit. Be my witnesses. Receive power. Will return. Alive to them. And in the chat, Ray has promise of the Father. Any reflection on this?
So let's start with what uh, Ray has in the chat. He said, there are many covenants, Noahic, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, and the new covenant. I believe that the new covenant includes Pentecost, along with Hebrews, Jeremiah, Acts, Joel, and John, and many more. In a quote, I will write my laws on their minds and I will pour out my spirit. And he mentions that anything mentioned that many times must carry some weight. Covenants. I was thinking that, that, that it shows that the mission that Jesus gave the first disciples is the mission we still have today, that we witness for Christ through our words and our actions. I was thinking one time we were talking, in previous ponder time, we were talking about covenants where the covenant was like a blood pact. Um, if you had two sides make a covenant, the um, whichever side didn't keep up their end would could die, like you could kill them. It's it was that it's that strong, that strong, and so the whole idea of God makes a covenant with His people, and there's no way we can keep this up. We can't stay faithful to God no matter how we try. We always sin. We always um, fail, and by those old covenant rules, we're doomed to die. And so the idea of Christ coming in and taking our place and dying for us and for our sins um, uh, is, is something that's very powerful. And when I ponder, think about it, um, makes my hair stand on end. When you think about what, um, what it was because, um, well, on a, on a, Different note, you know, marriage, uh, marriage is also a covenant. They talk about marriage as a covenant and not just a contract, not that you're going to do 50%, you're going to do 50%. And if you don't hold up your, your end of the deal, then I don't have to hold up my end of the deal. In marriage, you hold up your end of the deal, even if the other isn't holding up their end. And um, these were things that um, were like very, very instrumental in my 20s when I was getting back into the church again, um, because I was looking for, I wasn't looking for gray areas. I was looking for finality. I was looking for something I could hold on to. And it was pretty amazing to know from a historical perspective, when, when the Jews talk about um, Christ fulfilling the gospels, what he, what he was doing when he died. And end of lecture. Well, I agree with that. <laughs> I recently read a book that was written and um, they took a lot from people that were, um, I call them seers, but God allowed them to see certain aspects of his life where no one else did. So some of this stuff's written down. They don't ever, you know, bet anything that it's 100%. It's what these people remember. But that was the one thing that amazed me about the whole book, because it was about Christ's, um, you know, conviction and when he stood before Pilate, you know, all the way to his death on the cross. And it's just, um, it was amazing. It, even they started at the, at um, Gethsemane when he was praying to the father that he was actually taking on all the sins of the world from the beginning of time. And, you know, they talked about him sweating blood. I mean, he was just... You know, that was such a, such a burden, you can't even imagine, you know, and he was man and God, so he did, but I can't imagine a man, you know, being
being tasked with all that, but it is truly amazing to think of all that and for each one of us, you know, it's very, very cool. And, and, and willingly. Yes. Um, one, somebody once had said, don't worry about the definition of sacrifice. You want to know what sacrifice is? Sacrifice is something that costs you painfully and you do it again in a minute. That's sacrifice. When you love somebody, you do it again. Yeah. So. The words in this book talked about, you know, Jesus going through all these events and he prayed continually for all the people that were abusing him and for mankind. So, you know, he could turn around and smack the person that hit him across the head or said something bad to him, but he was praying for them the whole time, you know? And then he had a few words to say here and there and nothing was awful or, you know, mean, you know. It is truly amazing. And it makes me wonder. He just put the hammer to St. Paul and converted them. The apostles, after Christ's crucifixion, were scared to death and hiding out, trying not to get killed and stoned by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And Jesus comes in and says, hey, here I am. But they're still, yeah, that's cool. Are, are you going to be our savior? Are you going to get the Romans out of here and give us a third country? No, I'm not going to do that. I think Jesus had to put the hammer on them to change their attitude to go out and evangelize, to spread the word. It took all. Oh, Three days of blindness and I don't know how many years out in the desert to be educated. But the apostles already had the education, they just didn't have the motivation. I think that's what they were waiting for. That you said that's what they were waiting for? Waiting to have their attitude changed so that they oh, would yes. spread out and spread the gospel to the four winds. Yeah. I mean, the Bible talks about Paul, but I don't remember. There, there's a whole bunch of apocalyptic New Testament literature that they have found. And one guy went to India, another guy went to Spain, and one guy went down towards Africa. The apostles, all, all 11 of them, 12 of them, spread out in different parts of the world. And I don't think after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection that they are ready to do that. That wasn't for both no. of them. They were worried about staying alive. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't until Pentecost or later. Oh, that, that suits. And those thoughts are rolling through my mind. Okay. It's not well thought out. That's a, mine, won't, mine won't either. <laughs> Anyone else? I was um I was also thinking about he presented himself alive to them. And um again, what that 
what that may have felt like. Um, it must have been pretty surreal. And something I was thinking about, um, there, was, there was a time I had a near miss. I didn't have an accident. Um, it was my fault, but I had a near miss and my parents were in the car and I was driving. And um, I was going too fast and I was talking and I ran a stop sign with traffic, both directions, made it through. It was on a hill up over the hill, skip a little bit. I mean, I was going way too fast. And stopped the car and said, oh, uh, that was our turn. I guess I have to, you know, kind of turn around. And I, I, it took me a second by the side of the road to be like, I'm alive and I didn't kill anybody. I'm alive. <laughs> Uh, they're alive. We're alive. It's, it's, it was, it was tingling from the top of my head down to the bottom. It was, it was very, very present in, in my mind. And um, I mean, we were all fine, but it, uh, the car was fine, et cetera. Um, I may have made some drivers mad or someone thought I was crazy. I don't know. But to myself, um, I, and I remember I didn't even ask them if they were okay. I just asked, I just said, oh, I guess we're gonna need to turn around because I missed my turn. But the size of my heart in my chest, the tingling I felt top to bottom, the, uh, uh, the aliveness, things seemed very bright. Um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was an experience that uh, obviously they didn't have cars then, but when you think about being absolutely full and aware, aware of, of, um, something incredible just happened, um, that must have been maybe a little bit of what they had felt. I think that's probably an understatement because if I read the scripture correctly, Jesus came through a closed door. <laughs> that, that, that would take my breath away. Yes, that would take my breath away. So, and now he rises up to the sky. So, um, I, I'm just I'm, they had to sit around it and gather their wits after all that. Yeah, yeah. Took a few days to get it together again. Right, right. I mean, I wonder what their first thought was or feeling. I wonder what their first feeling was as he rose up and away from them. They were changing their underwear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> But there are several times in the Bible, you, it, it says things like after something, they see something amazing or, you know, Jesus comes after he was resurrected, then they all got together and spoke together about what had happened, you know, so I'm thinking they are excited and everybody going, you know, what, what happened? How, how can we, how does this fit into the whole plan? But I think with the Holy yeah. Spirit coming that. Um, that really centered them on their mission, gave them uh, enough um, where to to get going on it, and understanding more understanding of all the pieces of the puzzle they've been through. You know, if anybody was missing a piece here or there, it all came together faster for some than others. You know, I think John knew more than anybody probably because he was taking care of Mary, and and I think she already knew things that other people do ahead of time. All right, eight. All right, all right. Oh, the dog. Anyone else? Oh, Sue, you had something in the chat. Hold on. Sue in the chat said, Jesus had nothing else for the disciples to do other than wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Waiting 
because it was worth waiting for. Waiting because they had a promise it would come. Waiting until they could receive it. They couldn't create it themselves. Waiting to be tested. Very profound. Well, I don't know. Okay, shall we move on to the second reading? Um, um, a reading from the St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, may the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation resulting in knowledge of him. May the eyes of your heart be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope that belongs to his call. What are the riches of glory in his inheritance among the holy ones? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power for us who believe? in accord with the exercise of his great might, which he worked in Christ, raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every principality, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things beneath his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Do we have a word or phrase that comes to mind? Eyes of the heart. Yes, I love that one too, Jean. <laughs> In the chat, Ray has, what is the hope? Who fills, enlightened who fills all things in every way yeah. And so finally, you know, maybe we'll, you know, see something that might... Okay, may we hear it again. Brothers and sisters, may the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, resulting in knowledge of him. May the eyes of your heart be enlightened that you may know what is the hope that belongs to his call. What are the riches of glory in his inheritance among the holy ones? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power for us who believe? In accord with the exercise of his great might, which he worked in Christ, raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above every principality, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things beneath his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way.
Any reflection? I like the statement, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So, you know, some people are argue with you, all there is is the here and now. Well, no, that's not quite right. <laughs> now he makes several references to the next age, the coming age, which I think is exciting to think of. I think sometimes Christians have hearts I, I I love that that, that that phrase with the eyes of your heart and and sometimes I think people have hearts with no eyes and vice versa <laughs> eyes with no heart sometimes. <laughs> I mean, a, a, especially in searching for more uh, understanding, their their hearts are kind of closed. They they have one little idea of what they. They, they know and they don't want to delve any deeper into their faith. Well, or perhaps, perhaps they're still um, juvenile in their faith. It's, it's still, it's still coming out. I mean, um, you know, uh, you ask a, you ask a, like a child, right? A child's imagination. I mean, although it gets fantastic, sometimes like the most fantastic thing they can think of is just an ice cream cone. That's like the best thing that they can think of. And this is touching on a surpassing greatness of his power, exercising great might far above anything you could name. Name a principality, an authority, a power, a dominion, Pick, pick the, the, the most incredible thing that you can. This beyond even that is what I'm getting from, from this. Um, and, um, and also that, um, that we're all there. Who put all things. So we're included. That was the other thing that I got from this is that he includes everybody. Um, and, um, and God put Christ over the head of all things of the church, which is Christ's body. So we're, we're all there and it's like, think of the most incredible thing you can think of. This is beyond that. The pot that does a good job splitting this reading in half. Earth half talking okay. about it. No. Peel. And the second half saying, you know, God is pretty powerful. He can do just about anything he wants to. Uh, I already assumed that God created the universe with a thought, the word. So I don't put anything out of his ability. But the first half. What are his riches of glory? How does that affect me? Why is it that I personally want to buy into this for everyday living? Now, I was trying to think back subjectively, this marble rolling around in my head. Paul talks, talks a lot about life after death. I don't remember Jesus talking so much about life after death. Jews never really bought into this everlasting spirit. He talked about behavior here on earth parables and uh, the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't say, if you do this, you're going to have everlasting life with me. Generally speaking, there towards the end of his life, towards the uh, last of his 33 years, he 
brought it up a little bit. But that was never his thrust. That wasn't his primary theme. So I focused more on the first half. And uh, all in chapter 12 talks about how living righteously affects you personally in your everyday life. Everybody has a purpose. I don't know. I, I'm not sure about the first part of my bottle loss that Jesus primary same behavior and not spiritual afterlife. Well, it's like what Howard was saying in the beginning, which was, it's um, asking, you, you know, Christ was asking to live like him and that we have a Christian ministry here on earth. Yeah. And, and Christ was showing us what that ministry was through his life. I frequently say when faced with conflict, Assuming that I don't respond instinctively, then what would Jesus do? I know I can't do any of his spiritual fine things, but how did he behave? What an everyday occurrence. And then I think Paul goes along those lines too, saying, Live a holy life, live like Jesus. Everybody in Brett was sentenced to. Three to get three sentences. Yes. To I tried to diagram it, I couldn't. I got lost. <laughs> is is this one of his um in, in uh his introductions where he's not even gotten to the meat of his letter yet? <laughs> I think this is says it's the beginning of Ephesus or of, of his letter to the Ephesians. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, it also talks about hope. Um, and that's actually a theme in the, in the readings is the hope. Um, Jesus's um, ascension, his promise of the second coming. So I was just curious, um, what is, like, what does that hope mean for you? Anyone? When I think of hope for me, I think of, um, you know, uh, oh, how do I want to put it? Well, there's two things. One, one is I made a statement one time that it took me a while to come back to it again in my mind and realized how wrong I really was. I made a statement to a friend and I said that someone can never recover for this damage that was done to them. And it was a physical and psychological thing. And I said, I said to them, people never recover from this kind of thing. Well, that's really mm. a bad statement to make because then I'm saying that, you know, that it's not possible for God to ever heal anybody. And that's not true. All things are possible um, in God. And so that was really a bad statement to make. Um, but um, I think hoping in the, the life to come afterwards, those two things. For me well, second that thought and say in my opinion based on a wealth of medical knowledge that the gospel that your PTSD mm. people who are traumatized because the things they did were so far against their 
normal brain. And it affects it mentally. And if you study the, the Gospels, you can overcome that. Yes. The peace of the Lord. Make yeah. peace with yourself. Forgive yourself. Yeah, God can heal anything. But we have to believe it. We have to want it. I guess my so hope, my hope is a selfish hope. There are, um, you know, for the people that I know or the members of my family who's who've kind of walked walked away from Christ, or at least walked away from the church. Um, so I, I guess my hope is a little smaller and, and more selfish, but I hope they come back. I, I hope their, um, the eyes of their hearts are enlightened. If you ever figure out how to bring people back to the church, let me know. They got a long laundry list of people that need to come back. But what would that be like? I mean, just think of it. What would that be like if they just could love God the way we love God? It doesn't have to be very, you know, with a lot of demonstration or hoopla or anything like that. Just, just that knowledge. Um, just the acceptance of God. What would that, that be like if families were whole in that regard? That would be wonderful. <laughs> Those are very enticing. Greed, power, money. You know, have to give up that attitude yes yes uh let's see um i'm looking at the time we're still good um so ray put in the chat about spirit he chose some the line from isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 a spirit of wisdom understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. And then also says 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, summarizes the whole chapter. To each individual, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for some benefit. Thank you. Isaiah, that a lot of yes, yes. I hope it does fine. Could you say that again? I hope Isaiah does it fine. <laughs> no, I don't think I see it fine. <laughs> Shall we move on to the gospel? Whoops. Sorry, I lost my lost my camera there. Shall we go on to the gospel? Ready? The gospel according to Matthew. The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Then Jesus approached and said to them, "All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me." Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of age. Go.
make disciples. I am I am with you always. Ray has in the chat, I am with you always. Baptizing them. Can we hear it again? The gospel according to Matthew. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but they doubted. Then Jesus approached and said to them, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of age. I am with you always is very comforting to me. Okay. I had a neighbor once that said, I don't bother God with little things because he's busy enough with the bigger things. And, and I said, he cares about us in all things, even the little things. <laughs> you can't limit God's power. Very true. To do, Sue in the chat has worship is not typically associated with doubt. This is one case where the disciples' understanding of the world and the way they saw that God had previously worked in it did not match what they saw before them. And also in the chat, um, Ray has revelations. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will enter his house and dine him and he with me. And Ephesians, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were sealed for the day of redemption. All bitterness, fury, anger, Shouting and reviling must be removed from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving on another as God has forgiven you in Christ. Earth, pain, and need is what caught my attention. Okay. No matter what you do, Holy Spirit, he made me grieve, but he ain't leaving. He's still there. <laughs> All that say, don't piss off the Holy Spirit because he'll depart from you. That he's there and you are sealed. Yeah. Don't make yourself. But I thought that man uh, coincided with I will always be with you. No 
matter what you do, I'm still there. And Revelation says, I'm standing here knocking on your door. Why don't you open it up and let me in? That's all it takes. Well, last week I, I pulled a verse out of Shabbat saying, I offer you fire and water. Take what you want, and you will receive it. Where's that from? Shabbat. Chirac? I don't remember the chapter. Okay. What? We will. If I find it. In the, um, in the gray ponder area on page 139, it's, um, they were talking about the eyes of our hearts, which also translates to my thought or intention. And then it has this, um, this sentence. It is this enlightenment, the spirit's suffusion of light into our entire being that guides us into the fullness of knowledge and hope in Christ. So the idea of the spirit being with us, and I love that, um, idea of suffusion of light like coming out of every pore yeah that has a good um brings up a good picture in my mind of being everywhere like you know soaked into everything which is kind of cool dripping with the holy spirit And again, they talk about the eyes of our hearts. I, I, I really like that. I had thought about that a while back. And I had a, a gal tell me before, she was one of my supervisors and she had hired me for my last job, which I stayed at for 11 years. And she, she came to me to say goodbye. She says, you know why I hired you, Swim? When I first met you, she said, the one thing you told me was that, um, that you really like taking care of people and you know they were your heart you know and i said well because that's how i feel you know <laughs> and i i still feel that way i still miss nursing and it's still in my heart but that kind of how that's kind of how i look at it when it affects my heart it affects everything you know that, that was interesting i said oh. That's great feedback. Yeah, it was really, it was good to hear. I hadn't, you know, but I just, it isn't anything I even thought about before. I can't even remember what she had asked me. And I said, maybe why I like to be a nurse or something, who knows what it, what, what the question was. And I said, it's just, it's, it, it's my heart, you know, to take care of people. That's, that's what it is. That's, that's my love. And so she just thought that was, well, we, we you got to be hired then. So. Worked out pretty well. <laughs> she had ears that could hear. Yeah. That goes back to the old saying, if you, uh, if you love what you do, then it is at work. And that's, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people that feel that way, that whatever they do, it's in their heart and it's, it's something you love so much because of all that it gives you. And it, it's a rewarding, it's all rewarding. And if you, you love what you do and you put your whole heart into it, then um, it, it isn't a job, it isn't a burden and you don't get up every morning and dread going. You, it's it's almost like you get up in the morning and you're almost looking forward to what your day lies ahead. Yeah, that about says it, I think. I always felt I got more 
back than I ever gave. Right. The days were long, but I, I got more back than uh, than I put into it. I thought. I know exactly how you feel about it. Yeah. I, I Rebecca, felt that were you a nurse? About. Who me? Yeah, you were a teacher, a nurse. No, I I worked in the child nutrition uh, at the Judson School District, and. Um, I started out at the bottom and worked my way up. Um, and what I always told the people that worked for me, you have to love what you do and you have to never forget that we're here to feed hungry children. We're not here to get rich and we're not here to wash dishes and mop floors and uh, clean out the milk box. We're here to feed hungry children. And you have it's the bottom line. And um, I, I loved what I did. Uh, I did a lot of things and I drove a delivery truck. I washed dishes. I taught computer classes. Um, I did health inspections uh, for the state and um, I helped with the free and reduce applications. Um, I just did all kinds of things. It made my job interesting and it was never boring. Um, but the bottom line was we were there to feed children no matter what. It didn't matter if the fire alarm went off or um, or something happened to the refrigerator or whatever, we were always there to feed the children. And they, they depended on us. And um, it didn't matter to me where they came from or what color they were, that they were all hungry. They needed to be fed so they could learn. And, um, I loved every minute of it. I was there 24 years and um, I loved every minute of it. And for, for almost a whole year after I retired, I dreamed about going to work and working for free and not even getting a paycheck. I did. I actually dreamed about working for free. And I washed dishes, I carried out trash, uh, I served children, I cashiered, I, I did all kinds of things, but um, yeah. it was in my heart to feed these hungry children. Amen. Yeah. Very cool. Well, with that, let's get to our um, intentions. And um, let's, let's start by praying for all the children who are hungry that there might be Rebecca's in their lives. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our Lord, prayer. Hear our prayer. Yes, for all those who have no one to pray for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. I pray for priests and leaders of the church and that God may stir others' hearts to become leaders and priests in the church. Pray to the Lord. Lord, 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 Lord.
I'd like to pray for caretakers, um, especially those in the nursing homes where my dad is, um, for their efforts. We uh, pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Mary asks that we pray for peace. Um, let's pray for a peaceful solution to the many conflicts that are in our world by um, saying a Hail Mary. Hail Mary, 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 Mary of grace. Grace. Oh, the grace. Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Thank you to everyone for coming. Oh, thank, thank you. you for hosting. Thank you, Kristen. No thank problem. You. So we are next week. Oh, it's not Memorial. I mean, it's Memorial Day weekend, but it's not Thursday. Thursday is not part of Memorial Day weekend. So we will see you all no. in a week. Yay. Okay. Okay. Take care. Take care. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.